Good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Zittrain, and I am so pleased to welcome you to Harvard Law School's Treasure Room, also known as the Casperser Room. But today it is the Treasure Room because we have a treasured set of panelists and we have uh, a treasured discussion about to take place. This is, uh, for better or worse, this is as good as it gets in legal and uh, interdisciplinary academia. A wonderful book, a sparkling author, amazing commentators, and a group of interested and well-fed people to talk <laughs> about it. Like, life is good, spring is here. So with no further ado, uh, let me turn it over to Professor Cass Sunstein to get us started and tell us why nudge. Okay, great. So uh, basically my four favorite scholars in the world are on this panel. So uh, this is astounding for me. So uh, I'm not going to say a whole lot, let you hear them. But uh, I think I'll have roughly six propositions. That's, that's how we'll do this. Uh, proposition number one, uh, John Stuart Mill in his uh, highly influential plea for the harm principle uh, was wrong because his epistemic argument on its behalf uh, disregards human error. So the first proposition is that insofar as Mill said the individual is the best judge of what will promote his or her own interests, we just know now that that's empirically wrong. It's an empirical claim, and that because people often disregard aspects of products and activities, they are unrealistically optimistic, they assess risk uh, inaccurately, they're prone to procrastination and, 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 and uh, inertia. Mill's major prop for the harm principle is, is wrong. Proposition number two, Mill was wrong because he neglected the omnipresence of choice architecture, which is to say that the sorts of influences that he deemed illicit are omnipresent. And so long as we have an architecture in our cafeterias, on our websites, in our workplaces, in our universities, in our government buildings, in our social security system, in our police force, influences that have a coercive dimension, at least in the sense that they'll have a big impact on what people do, cannot be avoided. So a uh, really determined effort to follow Mill, Mill's harm principle, that's not possible in, a, in, in, the, in this world. The human environment doesn't admit of that. That's the second proposition. Okay, the third proposition is that choice preserving interventions, nudges, uh, have big desirable effects if they're carefully chosen and empirically tested. So we know that in Denmark, automatic enrollment in savings plans has a larger impact than significant tax incentives. Now, as a long-term University of Chicago person, I cannot believe either part of that sentence. <laughs> the idea that automatic enrollment has a massive of impact, that can't be true. The Coase theorem shows it can't be true. The idea that significant tax incentives have a modest effect, Gary Becker shows that's just not true. But both Coase and Becker are empiricists, if they're nothing else. And in this example, the data goes hard against them. And that's uh, a tale of a potent nudge that I think has profound implications for how we think of private and public institutions. As part of this general third pro proposition, nudges work, uh, there's a, a, a social scientist at Cornell named Brian Wensing, who's about to publish a book called Slim by Design. And the idea is that cafeteria design, what comes first, what comes second, what's on eye level, what's not, what's 200 feet away, once, what's 20 feet away, has big impact on what people eat. And you can have large effects, in fact, school cafeterias all over the United States are having large effects in combating childhood obesity and helping kids eat healthier just by changing cafeteria design. And back to my second point, no cafeteria lacks a design. Our credit card statute from 2009, and this needs much more um, 
uh, both research and understanding. We're just understanding a fact. Our credit card law from 2009 is saving Americans over $20 billion in charges a year. A very nice bit of news in connection with that is that the disproportionate enjoyers of that benefit are people who have bad credit ratings. So it's not just people who are you know, doing great. It's people who are struggling. And that law, while it has some mandates on, in it, has also default rules and nudges, including disclosure. So it's pervaded by choice-preserving interventions with a big effect. OK, proposition four. It's useful to distinguish between means paternalism and ends paternalism. And it's useful to distinguish between soft paternalism and hard paternalism. So I think Mill's arguments are most forceful insofar as we're talking about hard ends paternalism and least for, for forceful insofar as we're talking about soft means paternalism. So hard paternalism means a mandate, like a fuel economy law. The cars are gonna be more fuel efficient. Or you can't buy certain project products because they're unhealthy for you. That's hard paternalism. Soft paternalism is default rule, a warning, an information disclosure requirement, something that preserves freedom of choice. Means paternalism is designed to get you where you want to go, as a GPS is, or something that tells you by text message or statement on your bill uh, something about what's going to happen to you if you don't do something. Helps you get where you want to go. Ends paternalism is designed to revisit your own ends, as, for example, by telling you that you should, shouldn't have certain religious convictions or shouldn't fall in love with people who don't have the right uh, uh, gender. Okay, uh, that distinction between means and soft hard seems to me fundamental and that's the fourth proposition. The fifth proposition is that these are troubled distinctions, unfortunately. The reason the hard soft distinction is troubled is that the notion of choice preserving is itself uh, a little bit of a mystification. Any nudge is likely to impose some kind of cost on people, even if it's really low. And coercion, in the strong sense of you can't do it, is extremely rare. What usually happens with even a punitive instrument is you can do it, but you're going to have to pay a pretty big cost, like a jail sentence or a big fine. So the hard-soft distinction, I think the only way to cash it out, so to speak, is either to distinguish between material incentives and non-material incentives, like a fine would be not a nudge, but a psychic cost would be a nudge, or to simply bite the bullet and say we have a continuum of costs, and as the costs approach zero, it starts to look like a nudge. I'm not sure which to take. I'm not sure which to take is better. In terms of the um, means-ends distinction, the trick is any information disclosure requirement is going to be selective. It's going to like tell you what the fuel economy of your car is, but not the power or the coolness of the car. That's going to have an effect on your ends. A deeper problem, I think, is that insofar as nudges are designed to overcome, help people to overcome self-control problems, or their tendency to procrastinate, or present bias, focus on the short term. It's very hard to know whose ends we're talking about. Is it the person who wants the potato chips and the chocolate? Or is it the person who wants to live a long life and you know, look OK on the beach? Whose ends are we talking about here? I think this is very hard, at least in a certain category of cases, to make the, me the means-ends distinction uh, uh, sufficiently helpful. Okay, proposition six of my six is that there's a quintet of, obje of objections to nudges. They are, in a nutshell, uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity out there, different strokes for different people, and if we have, it's too kind of 
it's too much self-loathing if I made that rhyme. <laughs> so I, I dodged a bullet there. Uh, there's a lot of diversity, so uh, we want to object to any approach that puts people in a single bin. Uh, the government faces a knowledge problem, as the Hayekians emphasize. The government may be subject to the public choice problem, buffeted about by interest groups. Uh, people get welfare from making choices as they like, and maybe it's an insult to their dignity to prevent them from doing what they want. Okay, that quintet of objections, I hope I've said enough to say, suggest uh, works well as an objection to coercion, meaning each of them has a role. You have to take, worry about those things we're talking about, coercion, or high costs for people not going the preferred direction. But for choice-preserving approaches, uh, their force is greatly weakened. If people are diverse, they can go their own way. If the government is ignorant, then people can say, you're ignorant government. If people have welfare, get welfare, they like choosing, then they can choose. If it's an insult to dignity to force them, then they can assert their dignity by going their own way. This isn't to suggest that the quintet of objections is uh, dissolves in the face of a choice-preserving approach, but it's much weakened. So those are my six points, and the uh, final word is the lives we say may be those of our fellow citizens and our own. Thanks. Cass, thank you very much. It was uh, quite artful how point six was really five additional points, too. <laughs> you managed to get it in very well. Um, and of course, uh, it's such an amazing and balanced presentation, it makes me that much more curious to hear what our quartet of responders uh, is going to have to say to it. Uh, so we'll jump right into it. First with uh, Sandil Mulyanathan, and uh, feel free to introduce yourself a little bit to situate, uh, and then uh, take a couple minutes. Uh, I'm a professor of economics here, and um, I do a lot of work in behavioral economics. Um, this is a tough, a situation to comment because my guess is Cass and I agree on 99% of the outcomes. Uh, so I think I'm going to engage in the intellectual equivalent of finding grammatical mistakes. <laughs> so what is that? I'm going to quibble about language and a little bit about framing. So let me start with the first frame. It took me a long time to get away from this. Um, and I do think it's worth getting away from. I think, Cass, you start with the notion of human error. And it's I think that's a natural place to start. And in fact, I think that is a lot of where behavioral science started, at least disjudgment, decision-making literature. But in a weird way, I think it feels like inside baseball. Um, and it's inside baseball in that initially we had this rational choice framework, and then we said, well, let's try and show that people don't conform to it. And then we said, therefore, there's human error. But that was a stupid framework anyway. It's just a weird thing to oppose things to. You can't have the entire field of psychology to understand the complexity of the human brain be in opposition to some fairly ridiculous little model. I mean, the human brain is a complex organism with a richness of it. It would be as if we decided the way we were going to understand bird flight was to say, let's think of the perfect flying machine that's not even aerodynamically feasible, and now let's understand bird flight in contrast to it. That would be an idiotic way to understand the beauty and majesty of, majesty of bird flight. So I think that that's also a thing we should just give up on. Human error is not human error. That is to say that if I asked any of you, um, how many people yesterday went to sleep at the time that they would have liked to gone to sleep? Raise your hand. Is that an error? You? Who did that? <laughs> Look, there is a reason no one likes you. Now, no, she's just that, mistaken. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's the mistake you made. No. Now, I could sit here and say, we're all making a mistake, but what does that mean? We all know we're making a mistake, or are we? There's a complexity to our decision processes that we need to unravel and understand. So this is just by way of saying, I think as long as we stick at some deep level to the received paradigm, which starts with a weird view of human behavior and are reacting to it, I don't think we'll make forward progress. So I'll give some examples around <clears throat> why I think error might be the bad frame. One first simple example is that error makes you feel that there's a person out there who knows better. That's by notion of the notion of error. And that's misleading. It's misleading because sometimes it's not a person out there, it's you yourself who have a different direction of where you'd like to go. It's not even obvious that that direction is good. Maybe the time you went to sleep is a good time. 
Who knows? But that you have some conflicted preferences. Those conflicted preferences may show up as self-control, but they can show up in any number of ways. In deciding whether to come to lunch today, to come to this meeting, all of you surely had some conflicted preferences. If I had primed a part of your brain that was thinking about, I really should use the fact that I'm at Harvard to expand my breadth of knowledge, then you're more likely to come. If before making this decision, I had primed the notion that you have an exam that was coming up or something that was due, you would have said, I can't afford this. That's a conflicted preference. Which is the right choice? Who knows? I can't tell. You yourself can't tell. But that's the complexity of choice. To put it against the notion of right and wrong is, I think, misleading. And I think that that fundamentally gives more weight to the criticism against choice architecture than really is there. What does that mean, right choice? Do any of you know? Do I know? That's very hard. A second reason the notion of error is misleading, and I think Cass really touched on this very strongly, is, and I'm going to come back to this later, the notion of choice structure, choice architecture. And the reason it's misleading is because we can imagine some choice structures are simply better without suggesting that they're going to lead to one choice or not. For example, if you have a friend who just met this person and is just head over heels with this person, they met them on vacation and they're like, this is the perfect person for me, we've decided to move in together after this week. Is that a good choice? Is that a bad choice? Suppose you said, why don't you just take two days and think about it by yourself or talk to others? Do you think the quality of choice will be improved? I think most of us think yes. That doesn't mean we know the vector in which it's going to go. But the point is there are choice processes that we think all of us tend to have a shared understanding are going to improve the quality of choice. I'll give you a great example of this. <clears throat> a very good friend of mine, when she was young, she you know, had just moved to this apartment. And she was 23, and she was an intellectual, so she had this like, bookshelf full of books, like lots and lots of books. And um, she was very proud of this. Her grandmother came to visit. Her grandmother didn't know anything about books, didn't care, whatever, but she was in the apartment. My friend went out for the day and came back. And when she came back, all her books had been rearranged. And they'd been rearranged by color and size. <laughs> now, her grandmother felt she had just done a terrific reorganization because this just looked better. Now, that's not a great way to organize books for my friend. It's a great way to organize books for her grandmother. That's a sense in which you can see one choice process there or one structuring is better, but that doesn't mean it's going to lead to one book being chosen over another. So this is just a notion in which I think the notion of error keeps us forced in this frame of we're going to get people to do this thing. It's not necessarily the case. And that leads me to the second point, which is I think the phrase nudge, which is very evocative, is in a way less good than the phrase choice architecture. The phrase choice architecture is more like let's arrange the books in a way that makes it easy for people to choose the book they want and less about let's arrange the books so that people pick up the book Why Nudge by Cass Sunstein, which would be a nudge. <laughs> and I think that in general that, that phrase choice architecture is terrific. Let me <clears throat> end on two simple points. The first is once viewed in this way, I think there are some substantive intellectual questions I would love to see answered. The first is, what choice architecture do people themselves want? I do not at all for a minute believe the answer is, in all cases, people want all the choices available. That is by no means what Reveal Preference shows us. Imagine you went into a store, say Banana Republic, and they said, you know, we really feel bad just curating only a few types of clothing. So we've brought everything here. The crappy ones, the ones that have defects, everything. You pick. That would be idiotic. You would not go to that store again. That store probably exists in India, but that's not the point. <laughs> the, that just goes to say we have preferences over choice architecture. We have preference over choice architecture in the way we expect others to architect choices for ourselves. One of the most frustrating things in my life is that when I'm very tired and I'm having dinner with a friend, I'm like, OK, where do you want to go? And they go, where do you want to go? And I say, I don't know. Where do you want to go? <laughs> It's like, I just want you to choose. Because the only thing I prefer right now is to not choose. <laughs> and that's very common. Look at most people taking big financial choices. Imagine making a mortgage decision. You show up and they're like, good news, we have 100 mortgages for you. <laughs> what the hell? That's not good news. That's crappy news. That's just to say people have preferences against certain kinds of choice architecture. There are other times when people want all the choices in the world. And this is much trickier. I think this is a classic case where experts are just wrong. 
take medicine. Okay, the doctor comes in and says, you know, there's a very risky procedure. I think this is worth doing. Great, let's do it. The doctor comes in and says, there's procedure A, high risk, chance of death, blah, 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 here's what it is. Procedure B, higher chance of survival. I'd like you to choose. I'm like, why are you being paid so much? I've seen this latest data release. You get paid a lot. You're paid to choose for me. Pick something. Now, of course, there are situations where I want to choose. If it's, for example, the side effects are things I can only know about, like how much do I value incontinence, et cetera. So it's not always I want the doctor to choose, but a shocking amount of times, of course I want the doctor to choose. They're the experts. That's what they're paid to do. So let me conclude by just saying, all of this leads me to raise the question of what is freedom? Why do we presume that freedom means free to choose? Freedom often means freedom to not choose. I don't want a lot of choices. Freedom often means freedom to have a choice architecture that allows me to choose best. Or freedom, I think, is a much broader sense of the word. And I think that in some sense, one way to understand all this is that perhaps the most scarce resource we all have is mental capacity, attention. Sometimes I've called this bandwidth. If bandwidth is our most scarce resource, then every act where someone gets me to choose is an act that's costing me bandwidth. And in some sense, that's expensive. So what I would like is to be able to apply my bandwidth, my choice, to the things that I know best about and matter most to me. But for the rest of my life, I actually would like it to be taken care of. That's what rich people do. So let me just stop there and thank you. Sandil, thank you so much for that uh, incredibly thought-provoking set of comments that I'm still in my head trying to figure out how much are in opposition to one another. And I figured instead of my thinking about it, you should just tell me, but I uh, <laughs> can do that later. Frank Michaelman, on to you. Uh, I'm Frank Michaelman. I used to teach here. Uh, 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 I, can't, I can't take time for extended commendation. I just want to say that I really like this book, uh, and you can uh, already see how much of a stimulation to thought I thought you were going to say, uh, and you can purchase it over uh, here uh, following the... Uh, uh, Cass has, has given us. I'm going to try uh, a quick takeoff of my own from Cass's work uh, by which I'm aiming to convey some of the flavor uh, uh, and stimulation to thought that he has provided to us. So I'm going to put on the table two conceptual pairs uh, that Cass uses. One is the welfare autonomy pair. The other is system one, system two. Uh, welfare uh, uh, autonomy. The import of this pairing for Cass is to raise questions about the extent to which the choice of tools of state paternalism should be steered. The choice of tools should be steered so as to make a due allowance for claims of autonomy, even possibly at the expense of welfare. So autonomy and welfare are, to that extent, in that sense, opposed. Uh, to allow for autonomy is to give up uh, or to retreat in some way on welfare. Uh, to press the cause of welfare to the limit uh, is to put pressure uh, on autonomy. So welfare, welfare is measured let's say, as the level of satisfaction of a person's ends or her system of ends or maybe her system after some sort of editing, uh, welfare uh, has a kind of brute factual aspect. At any moment, a person's system of ends is what it is uh, and the level of satisfaction uh, is what it is and people presumably, uh, or maybe I should say tautologically, people presumably or tautologically want welfare seek welfare. Now, autonomy uh, then has to be understood as a value that is, I'm going to say, objectively assigned to the exercise by any person of her power and responsibility to work out her own system of ends and also to decide the means uh, by which they'll be pursued. I'm saying objective in order to keep autonomy from collapsing into welfare. Autonomy is not just a matter of a person's contingently happening to want this freedom. Uh, otherwise, there's no autonomy welfare opposition. It'll collapse. Autonomy then has to be a value that we assign objectively to um, self-steering 
regardless of whether the person in question happens to want it um, or not. Uh, okay, now system one, system two. System one, uh, uh, these are systems in the brain, if you like. Uh, system one is autopilot. System one is instinct, hard wiring behind our back, steering towards uh, our acts, uh, steering of our acts and decisions. System one is the stronghold of heuristics, so-called. Heuristics are like shadows or cosmic rays or the flights of birds that throw the autopilot uh, off course. So the availability heuristic, the salience or immediacy to us of some event or event type works uh, as a proxy for its expected likelihood of recurrence or its frequency over time. System two is the prefrontal cortex. It's the site of rational and complex calculation and decision. So among other things, it's the place where uh, the character of the heuristic as a heuristic is, express is expressly recognized uh, and opened up, uh, explored. <coughs> So the general import for CAS of the system one, system two pairing is that justified state paternalism then can be described as the collectively organized and cons the collectively organized consultation and invocation of system two as a device of error correction on the operations of system one. A nudge is often a prod to the person to get her system two up and running. Okay. Now, I want to put this question. I got these two pairings. What happens if we try to combine them or merge them? Uh, can we say something like welfare goes with system X and autonomy goes with system Y? W one of them goes with system one, the other goes with system two. If I put that to you, which way would you do it? Um, uh, uh, well, okay, try this. Since welfare has this aspect of brute factuality that I mentioned, while in contrast, the valuation of autonomy is apparently a product of cerebration about objective values. Autonomy comes from Kant, it comes from Rousseau, it comes, right? It comes from Emerson Hall, where presumably <laughs> system two is in control. Um, we might say, well, okay, welfare is system one, goes with system one, autonomy goes with system two. Now comes Cass's reckless suggestion. Cass flips it. Uh, he just flips it over. Uh, his reckless suggestion is autonomy is a production of system one not system two. Autonomy is a heuristic. I'm not sure he ever puts it in quite those terms, but we've got the autonomy heuristic. Autonomy, this impulse we assert to be let alone to figure it out and decide it and work it out for ourselves, that's a proxy for and a reification of the epistemic claim that we know better than any outsider what's going to work well for us and improve our welfare position. It's a proxy for and a reification of an instinctual sense. Instinctual, it's a sense burnt in over hundreds of thousands of years of an orders of magnitudes simpler form of uh, existence for Homo sapiens. Uh, and over those hundreds of thousands of years, it worked well enough to have an evolutionary survival value. So it's bred into us, don't tread on me, is um, instinctively bred into us by evolutionary selective processes, something like that. Uh, autonomy is an instinct, it's a heuristic, and so it's the office of system, uh, system two to see this and to perform the requisite deconstruction in the interest of a rational pursuit of welfare. This is a blow up, a measured blow up, a reckless blow up of autonomy from a position that's primarily welfarist. I think that probably is a fair account of the slant of the book. But I want to say this book, in its explorations of the pros and cons, first of all, of paternalism versus abstinence from paternalism, and secondly, for 
uh, uh, an argument uh, in the defense of soft paternalism, nudging, uh, as against hard paternalism, regulating. Uh, uh, it walks along the path. It sees every stone that I am aware of where an objection might lurk. It turns over the stone. It takes an honest look uh, into um, the space. Of course, it doesn't get to the bottom of every one of those holes. It's a short book. Um, uh, but it's admirable, I think, in the way that it lays the thing out. Now, uh, uh, we haven't reached the ends of the complications of this, which, which system uh, 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 takes which, which factor. And I'm going to close just by mentioning a paper uh, by Rick Pildes and Ryan Bubb that uh, I, uh, I know Cass has read because he's credited uh, uh, in a footnote. And I think he may have had it uh, in mind, among a lot of other items, in composing his chapter five on the discontents of soft paternalism. Pildes and Bubb make the point, and they don't put it uh, in these terms, doing so is my contribution. They make the point that the political fact of demand for autonomy, the operations of the autonomy heuristic in system one, uh, uh, now has a presence in the state's system two. Figures in the state's system two, it figures as a factor uh, in the social welfare oriented calculations of state officials deciding on whether to employ softer or harder paternalistic tools. They argue that the state sometimes retreats from the harder tool that might do a better job out of a perception that it's politically necessary to do so in order to make the paternalism go down at all and uh, prevent basically political um, rebellion. So um, autonomy as value, autonomy as heuristic, autonomy as political fact keeps jumping back and forth uh, uh, between these two systems and uh, it's a part of the merit uh, uh, of, uh, of Cass's book that he exposes this very complex and subtle um, interplay between factors that we might have thought of in much more simplistic uh, terms, and that's where I'll stop. Thank you, Frank. It is a pleasure to see you working what I think you referred to in your talk as the requisite deconstruction <laughs> of the, the topic. Such a pleasure to see it. And it sounds like possibly between system one and system two, you have rehabilitated error as a concept after Sandil <laughs> attempted to deconstruct it. I don't know which one of you is wrong, but um, we will find out. Iris, you come to us from the world of policy uh, and such. Delighted yeah, to hear thank what, you. Uh, thank you, you for having say. me. Yes. Um, so I'm a professor of public policy at the Kennedy School and also the academic dean and the behavioral economist. So it'll be hard for me to be very controversial. What I'm going to try to do is uh, to push the boundaries of our thinking maybe a little bit. I'm a big fan of Cass's work, and including of this book. So I highly, highly recommend it to all of you. I want to make one comment and then kind of three questions. Uh, the first comment is about choice architecture and how omnipresent it really is. So I walked over here from the Kennedy School through the yard and saw the beautiful chairs again. So colorful and you all know them. And it happens to be the case that I know the landscape architect um, because he's doing some work for us at the Kennedy School now who designed the yard. You would not believe how much work went into the selection of these chairs. How heavy they are. Are there benches? Are there movable? How many tables? How many chairs? Reclinable? Colors? Uh, soft ground? Should they be on the grass? Should they be in front of the science center? How high are the trees? Maybe you have to cut the trees a little bit. Maybe too much sun, too little shadow, whatever. So clearly landscape architects right, create environments for us all the time to promote certain types of behaviors. So for example, this room probably wasn't created for mass audiences. It's very hard to find. Um, That's the best insertion of passive aggression into a <laughs> comment I have seen all day, except for what I just did. <laughs> OK. Um, uh, but I love being here. <laughs> Uh, so three comments, um, or questions really more. Uh, 
so I want to want to think a little more about kind of the third argument, the welfare argument, and how choice architectures or, or nudges are really welfare enhancing. And I, in my mind, we have to think about two kinds of questions. The first one is, who are we doing this for? So a first category of problems might be the problems where I think I have a problem and like to fix it. For example, I might want to eat less Swiss chocolate. I'm Swiss, so I'm very biased. Um, so I might want to, and then I turn to Cass, and he might give, give me advice on how to manage my self-control problem. That's one category of issues. Another one is someone else tells me to do something. So in contrast to Sandal, interestingly enough, I think I'm a bit more interventionist with my doctors. So when I had uh, my kids and had to have them tested for like a million things, I wanted to know from the doctor, you know, what are false positives, what do I learn from this test, false negatives, how do I think about this test, and I really disliked being nudged. I really disliked the doctor telling me, oh, I know you're doing this one test, but by the way, it's very easy, we can just add these other five, it's just going to be in one thing, and I'm like, yeah, but you know, I don't understand, I don't know, and help me understand. So I think that's an interesting problem for us. So someone else knows better, and in particular if there's information asymmetry, you know, how, how do I think about that from a welfare argument? Sometimes they might know better, I think that's Sandel's scenario, and sometimes maybe not. Maybe they should know how I feel about these different risks, and maybe I would actually tell him, well, with a chance of 0.001, I'm not going to do it. Um, so that's, I think, a second category of welfare problems. The third one, which is the hardest one, is where a third instance, a third authority, a third someone, a third party uh, knows or decides um, on our collective behalf. So that might be us thinking littering is a bad thing. While it's in all our self-interest to litter, it's very convenient to do so, we collectively might think littering is not a good thing and therefore decide to nudge people. Um, for example, there are beautiful um, trash cans which applaud when you put something into the trash can or they sing opera. Um, in Scandinavia, so you know maybe, uh, but that's a very soft notch. It's a lovely notch. Uh, so I'm not, but but I do think these are three different categories that we want to think hard about. Um, how, you know how we use notches in those three instances. Then my second question around welfare is something that you know you touch upon, Cass, but I haven't fully, I think, understood, and that is why are we so sensitive when it comes to choice architecture? by the government, but not by private sector companies. Now I can make up arguments, like there's Leviathan, right? So market competition doesn't quite work with the government. I can't easily move to a different country because I don't like the choice architecture in the United States. But I can switch from Pepsi to Coca-Cola if I don't like what Pepsi is doing or Coca-Cola is doing, vice versa. So I get kind of the market competition argument, but it is quite interesting how we have lived with marketing and manipulation forever, and now that the government is starting to think about this for the benefit, I hope, of society more generally, we're like so outraged, or some of us are really outraged. So that's kind of my first set of questions around welfare. Um, a, second question, a second set of questions is around um, the means versus the ends that you described. And I completely agree that uh, what we do with not just or with choice architecture, we uh, think about how people make decisions. Not what they choose, but the how. So it's all about the how, so it's all about the process. Uh, but I don't think as a community of behavioral economists, behavioral decision scientists, psychologists, we have a good understanding of the psychological processes now that happen when we nudge people. So one, I think, big question for us as a field is, how sustainably am I going to change someone's behavior? Is this just for the moment where I nudge you to do X, and then next time the nudge is absent, you will discontinue that kind of behavior? Let me give you an example. So when I talk about choice architecture, I often show a video where in um, Sweden, uh, people have transformed staircases into pianos. So you walk up the staircase and it makes this beautiful music, like in the Science Museum here in Boston. Um, and the question is, does this crowd in intrinsic motivation that I, and now I discovered the joy of climbing stairs. So therefore, even if there's no piano in the future, I'll be a stair climber. Or might it even crowd out my intrinsic motivation? I will never ever climb a stair any, anymore, um, unless it is a piano, of course. 
So I think that's an important question for us. I mean, now us, the behavioral economists, the behavioral scientists here at the table, to really understand, you know, the nudges. And sometimes people buy durable goods, they buy new refrigerators, so we know they'll, they'll um, consume less energy going forward. But kind of, I'm, I'm interested in these psychological mechanisms. When do they change norms? When do they crowd in, crowd out intrinsic motivation? Um, thirdly, um, and this is uh, <laughs> an addendum to your comment on diversity. Um, that's the one that, the one criticism that drives me most, not most crazy, maybe not true, but that drives me crazy a little bit because it is in particular with diversity where we do extremely badly, where we should just not trust our in instincts, our gut feelings, our intuitive judgments. I mean, you might be familiar with the work of Mazarin Banaji on implicit biases. Uh, so we don't have a good handle in this country or elsewhere in the world to deal effectively with diversity. An example that you probably are familiar with is that most um, large orchestras now have the musicians audition behind curtains because they know that if they don't do that, they will be much less likely to hire the high-performing women and minorities. That was an experiment run in the 90s. Uh, Claudia Golden and Cecilia Rouse have um, uh, examined its impact, and it significantly increased the likelihood that uh, the best performing uh, musicians are women or minorities if you have them audition behind the curtain. So I get the diversity argument, absolutely we're not the same, but that in fact is an area where we need choice architecture. We need curtains to help our biased minds to get things right. Thank you uh, very much, Iris, and it, it raises so many questions. Among them, um, why why nudge is so vital right now, because uh, while I think one of Cass's observations was that there's no such thing as an unarchitected space, there is always something there, um, the skills that the architect could draw upon to influence behavior and nudge maybe have been weaker in the past and they're getting stronger over time due to insights about psychology, due to A-B testing. I think of your story of the landscape architect Instead of having to think ahead of time about what the perfect chair is and then one day they materialize in Harvard Yard and they're going to be there for the next 30 years, is a B test. So you have a big chair and a little chair and you see how many people sit in one and before you know it, there's zero theory, but we have through iteration come up with quote unquote the perfect chair and in the hands of private companies and others that are trying to drive other behaviors rather than what satisfies perhaps the consumer, that seems quite powerful and of course too, more and more inputs to us are pervasive. As we're walking around with Google Glass, there are many more instances of being able to prompt us for that three seconds, maybe not long-term behavior, but short-term, that just weren't there before. And it so nicely connects to Cass's other work on personalization and the dangers uh, in Cass's view of that. So thank you, and now for our last uh, commentator, on to Dick Fallon. So thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Thank you, Cass, for this um, wonderful book. As those of you who know anything about Cass know, this is uh, one of a succession of wonderful books. Uh, people often say to me, if you read Cass's latest book, uh, and I instinctively, reflexively answer no, because I've read three books by Cass in the last week, but I'm sure that he's produced another uh, in the past two or three days that would qualify as his latest. Uh, of all of those books of Cass's that uh, I uh, like and admire. I actually in some ways like and admire this book and the project of which this book uh, is a part the best. Uh, it seems to me that he's engaged in the really colossally important project of working out the relationship between psychology and morality. Um, and I don't think uh, that uh, anybody has yet come to terms with the questions uh, that he is raising in this uh, book, though in some ways I think Frank Michaelman has begun to uh, today, perhaps more than I'm aware that anybody else uh, has. Uh, but it's a colossally important project trying to figure out the moral implications of psychology, it makes the project colossally ambitious uh, because Cass needs both a moral theory and a psychological theory to carry the project uh, off. The moral theory, uh, about which he doesn't say a great uh, deal, and I don't want particularly to dwell um, on, is a form of consequentialism 
uh, that is fundamentally compatible to what he calls uh, libertarian paternalism uh, because he thinks that the government with the right kinds of nudges uh, or shoves uh, can push people to be, uh, improve their own welfare, which he takes as the ultimate uh, measure of what the government uh, ought to be aiming uh, at. And so I'm just happy to accept that uh, for the moment. Uh, what I want to think a little bit about is how that collects, connects to a psychological uh, theory. And it seems to me that here, uh, I hope I'm getting this right, that the psychological theory that Cass uh, operates with is the Kahneman uh, psychological theory. It's useful to think about the way all of us thinks in terms of track one and track uh, two. Uh, track one is instinctive, spontaneous, operates on the basis of uh, heuristics, smells good, I want that uh, right now, uh, that sort uh, of thing. Uh, and then track two is the more thoughtful, more deliberative, stand back, is that what I really uh, want? I may eat it now, but will I be regretful later? I may spend the money now, will I be regretful later when I haven't saved? Uh, and so uh, forth. And so what we want to do, given the moral theory, is to try to improve the welfare of this self uh, by its own lights. But then the problem that the psychology has introduced is the problem of, well, now what's the self whose welfare uh, we want to uh, improve? Is it the track one uh, self, the spontaneous uh, self who just wants things? Is it the rational, reflective, deliberative uh, self? Uh, or once we've splintered track one from track uh, two, have we so dissolved the notion of a stable self with wants that we can unproblematically uh, articulate uh, at any particular uh, time uh, that it becomes slightly more mysterious exactly who or what uh, welfare we're trying to improve. Uh, now, in terms of contrasts with the uh, psychology uh, Cass uh, has, here if I just start a little bit on the moral side where he seems uh, to be most uh, interested, the people that he sees as his enemies, or not enemies, Cass doesn't frame the world uh, that way, but the people he wants to nudge, the people with whom he wants to engage in friendly uh, debate are um, the people who are the economists and the autonomists. And now the economists are people that he assumes think that people have stable, long-term wants, and they know at any particular time best how to achieve uh, their wants. Uh, the people who value autonomy are people who say, well, people ought, ought to be able to get what they want even if it won't improve their welfare. And Cass in the book is carrying on a number of sophisticated uh, conversations, discussions uh, with these. But I think part of the problem, part of the reason that the conversation hasn't yet got richly satisfying has nothing to do with any problem uh, in the way Cass is presenting uh, things. The problem has to do that the people who he is trying to nudge, the views of classic uh, economic man or woman on the one hand or classic adherence of autonomy on the other hand really haven't yet come to terms with the problem that launches him which is the psychology that distinguishes track one thinking from track two thinking. Uh, so he's trying to carry on a debate. Once he's started to think these through, with people who haven't thought it through uh, yet in, late of, in light of the strongest, uh, most recent psychological uh, research. And so how are we to make sense of that debate and who's uh, winning it when it's not yet been fully engaged? So it's hard to make full sense once until the debate has been fully engaged. But one more psychological picture uh, that I want to put onto the table is one that Cass doesn't mention. Uh, in the book, and I think it's actually interesting uh, that Cass doesn't present this picture. Uh, and that's the psychological picture presented by people who often labor, label themselves as situationists. So a situationist is somebody who believes that the way people believe, be, behave tends to depend almost totally on the situation. There is no stable underlying personality. 
Uh, if you want to know what's going to happen uh, if somebody is put uh, in a room where an experimenter says turn up the electricity so that we can teach the experimental subject a lesson, uh, then what you want to know is not a lot of bio biographical details about the person walking into the room, but you want to know uh, everything about the situation. Once you know about the situation, then you know uh, how people will behave. Now, for purposes of connecting psychology with morality, their crucial central thing about these situationists is they dissolve the human personality in such a way that the intuitively plausible moral claims of both the classic economic thinkers and the classic autonomy uh, thinkers cease to seem sensible. Uh, so um, if that's the way people were, then the classic autonomy, then, then the classic economic consumer sovereignty model wouldn't uh, make uh, any sense. The classic autonomy model wouldn't uh, make any sense. If there were somebody trying to design a world, what you would try to do would be to z design the world uh, such that people were either happier or better, but to try to figure out what made them either happier or better, you wouldn't start thinking that you've got some coherent core of human personality with which you're you're working. Now, the, one of the things I say that's fascinating to me about Cass's book, it's so rich on the psychological uh, side, he spends the whole book uh, responding to the people with the worries from classical econo economic model and the autonomy uh, model, but suppose you came at it from the other side, and I say, look, I'm a situationist, uh, and as a situationist, it seems to me that the clear lesson that comes from this uh, Kahnemanian psychology uh, is that we just ought to create a situation in which people are either happy or better. We ought to forget uh, about uh, choice. We ought to forget the idea that people know uh, what's best for themselves. Let's just, you know, th ma make the world uh, the best it can be with these people as sort of plastic uh, in our hands. Now, if the, situ if the challenge came not from Cass, but from the people uh, in the economic and the autonomy uh, models, I can imagine that the reaction uh, would be one that involved a jolt of terror, a jolt of terror, start to disaggregate human psychology so that we no longer know who the person is whose tastes we're concerned uh, with, what uh, his or her long-term uh, or short-term uh, values are uh, and so forth and we are on the path to treachery and moral perdition and uh, recreating uh, the world uh, so, so, so that what we want to do is not uh, to uh, satisfy the needs and legitimate uh, demands of humankind but improve uh, them. And at that point I can imagine uh, somebody uh, who begins either uh, with, the liberta with the autonomy view or the classic economic uh, view is saying until there is more proof on the table, until this is better thought out, uh, until we've got a better grip on what to make of human uh, psychology and the moral entitlements of um, people in light of their psychologies, I'm just not ready to start down that road uh, that Sunstein makes looks so it makes look so gentle and so appealing. I am just going to insist as a moral matter rather than as a psychological uh, matter uh, that people as they are uh, have an entitlement to choose for uh, themselves whether it's on the assumption that this is what's going to uh, make them uh, happier or whether it's on the assumption uh, that this is what they are morally uh, entitled uh, to do, but my psychology is going to be what I'm going to call an ascriptive rather than a descriptive uh, psychology. It's not going to be sensitive to these social scientific experiments because these social scientific experiments are so potentially um, destructive of traditional moral frameworks. I am going to deal not with empirical psychology but with moral psychology and my moral psychology. Uh, is one in which people are capable of choosing and entitled uh, to, to choose. And that's, I just can't wait to hear more in this debate because I think that's where the debate ultimately will play out most interestingly. 
Dick, thank you so much. It's been amazing to see this panel at work as a series of sequential, nominally sequential uh, comments that are already a dialogue to see people picking up on concepts that have come before. It makes me wonder if we had reordered the panelists, would it be a completely different conversation? Um, I know we have a hard stop at one, so we have five minutes left, and Cass has been dutifully writing things down as people have been talking. <laughs> so um, I think, Cass, you should get the last word in the exact five minutes that we have. And one other just question to throw in, you can dress it or not as you like, is we've been thinking in your frame of the state in some ways affecting the behavior of the citizen and the, uh, the, the person operated upon as a person, as a natural person. Um, I'm curious if you ever think, given that even states themselves only operate through the actions of people, singly or together, is it possible to nudge states? Uh, and in international affairs, could you see somehow helpfully deploying this, or are states as artifacts beyond this kind of individual psychology? Yeah, yeah. Those are all great. So um, in terms of nudging states, uh, the president through executive order or through a speech can nudge his own government, certainly. Uh, in terms of international arenas, uh, there are discussions going on at the United Nations on current events and uh, you know, their, their efforts to influence one another. And it would be surprising if some uh, ideas involving framing and social norms and default rules haven't played a role in the last 50 years of international affairs. So there's a big empirical project and conceptual project there, but mm. uh, certainly this is relevant. We're at the tip of the iceberg there. Uh, on on Sendel's point, uh, it's surely true that the idea of human errors isn't um, friendly framing. It's a little like un-Gladwell, where Gladwell, his, his, his name is very good in this connection because his books make people feel happy you know, you blink, you get it right. Uh, with a little tip, everything can get good. Uh, and the ocean of human error, that, the system one thinks, who's talking to me about human error? You know, that's mean and uh, uh, arrogant. So he's clearly right on that. Uh, and he's also right that the antonym to human error may be wildly over-demanding and unhelpful. Uh, all I'd like to say is that there's some segment of decisions where uh, people are just not seeing something that's there, or they're making a mistaken judgment of fact. Do more people die by suicides or homicides? Most people say homicides, the fact is suicides. It's an error of fact. And whatever the universe of problem is, we know a lot of er areas where people get the facts wrong. So there, there's an area there. On, on Frank's point about system one, system two, there's a lot of truth in what he said. I'm, I'm concerned that the book isn't clear enough and it gives itself to an, an unhelpful kind of pun. And I want to un, un pun. This is going to take the pun away. So system one might say, I want those potato chips and I want them for lunch, dinner, and breakfast. And system two might say, that's not good for your welfare. And system one will say, I really enjoy it. Why don't you shut up system two? And so then system two is, system one is being welfareist and there's an internal dialogue. Uh, system one can also say, I want to do this now. Don't tell me not to. True, it's not so great. And actually, I wouldn't have wanted to do it so much except you told me I couldn't. So system one can be very pro-freedom of choice, just as system one can be very pro-potato chip. So system one and system two don't map on simply to welfare and autonomy. Is that clear? What Frank is calling the reckless suggestion, he's too generous to use that adjective, and I'm sufficiently skeptical about my own judgment here not to have used that adjective. So it's my adjective, reckless. But the reckless suggestion operates along another dimension from this one we just discussed, and it's when people assert a strong autonomy claim is that because they have a freestanding Kantian position? Or is it because they have a quick, automatic, intuitive sense, get away from me, government? And the reckless suggestion is many of our judgments about autonomy are really welfare judgments, really fast and compressed. I think 
Dick will say at this point you need a moral argument and not a psychology experiment. And he's quite right on that, which is why it's a reckless suggestion. But uh, I make it. Okay, Iris raises a bunch of uh, excellent points, and I'm just gonna go at one, which is why are we sense so sensitive about choice architecture from government, and not so much about choice architecture from the private sector? I'm gonna give an empirical speculation, which is um, uh, brackets the question whether those who believe there's a difference are right to believe it. And the empirical suggestion is that system one. System one says about government choice architecture, oh man, I'm mad. And system two is typically, system one is typically more relaxed about choice architecture from the, from the private sector, typically. And that's the empirical claim. Okay, on uh, Dick's many points, all I wanna do is underline that there are many domains in which he's right to say that the agent whose will we are respecting or whose desires we are promoting with choice architecture or nudging is a really hard question. And that's because of the permeability of the person's preferences over time and situation. I do think that the situationist view so-called um, is a little too broad-based, I think, to be empirically correct. That's, I haven't defended that, but that's my view that it takes certain important experiments and has too broad a generalization from them. And I do think it's correct that the quintent of ob objections, if you remember, heterogeneity, government lack of knowledge, public interest, uh, interest group pressure, the public choice problem, respect for dignity, maybe that's a heuristic, maybe not. People get welfare from choosing. All five of those apply to what would seem to me uh, an extravagant understanding of the situation of psychology uh, to go, go for coercion. So on behalf of everybody in the room and the three people who had to leave exactly at one, can I say that both our system one and system two are extremely pleased for how we spent the last hour, chock full of ideas and also of decency, and it's a great quality. We thank you for this. Thank you all.